Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is the computer vision course CAC 463 and CAC 565. It's a joint course uh, with undergraduate students and graduate students. Um, I will first like to go over the syllabus of the course. The syllabus available at our Teams page or the model page. Okay, so this is my name. For those of you who don't know me, my email address is this. So take a note of it. And my phone number is this. If you need to contact me for some reason, uh, I prefer the email. Just send me an email. I will try to get back to you. Okay. Uh, before I go even further, I I like to say this. Uh, all the information about this course, including the uh, announcements, course material, the uh, uh, exams and the homeworks, will be kept on our Teams page and the Moodle page. The Teams page is this page. You know about the Teams page because you are here. You are listening to me now. And there is another uh, page which is called the departmental departmental uh, model page. I may use that uh, model page too, but for now I think I am going to use the uh, uh, Teams page. Let me try to let me try to show you the Teams page. The place there where I store my uh, files. Okay, this is our Teams page. If you go to the file section here, you will see our syllabus is there. So the syllabus includes all the information about the important information about the, uh, the course as general information. Uh, my name and my email address is in, in that uh, uh, syllabus. So. Uh, just download the syllabus and keep it uh, for the whole semester because you're gonna need uh, some important information contained in this uh, syllabus okay the other the other place where I keep information or sometimes assign homeworks to you is the, our Moodle page to go to the Moodle page many of you have used Moodle pages before but for those of you who are new to this department or who are new to this uh, uh, model system, you just go to, you just type, uh, gives a technical university, big SRM, honestly, and model, I guess when you say this, it finds the address the address is this bilmuh.gtu.edu.tr model when you go there you need to log in to be able to log in you need a um, account at the model page if you have an account just log in otherwise you need to fill in this application form I have my login address and the password. I am logging in. Once you log in, you will see lots of classes on the left side. Okay. Go to home and find the classes. You are going to find this uh, computer vision page group and join to that group. When you go there, you will have information there. Just uh, if there are any homeworks, you will find the homeworks. For now, I don't have anything, but uh, I may assign some of the homeworks from the model page. We did not make that decision yet. Uh, the, I think the university has an alternative system, alternative model. They are working on it. We started getting some emails on it. But usually, uh, uh, when they start something as new system, uh, there would be some problems. So I am going to wait until until that system works fine. After that system starts working, maybe the university may ask us to switch to that system. 
so we are going to wait until then uh, i will keep all the course related information and i will do the i will do the announcements about the course using our model system and the teams pages okay so teams and model are important so do that so how many people did we have participants for now total of participants is 20 20 people are there but for some reason i have only eight people in this meeting i don't know what's going on do you think people are people think that the, the class will start at 14 30. Uh, i don't know okay uh, so i am recording this uh, lecture uh, both with the teams uh, recording function also i am recording it locally using my obs software this red uh, red mark here obs means that i am recording this lecture on my local machine and i post uh, these videos on the uh, youtube on my channel and if you go there actually you may see my last year's computer vision videos too so from time to time if i if i fail to record my uh, videos maybe i will refer to the previous year's videos for you to to see let me go to okay here yeah my studio right if i go to my studio i think i did a yeah i did lecture today where is your content i did a lecture today and i po already posted it in here okay so usually the names of the names of the uh, files are chosen in a way that the, the semester and the name of the course and the date and the small description of the content today i did this one in the morning csc 312 spring and the march 1st and i um and i i typed the the content of the course in there okay so 14 people already viewed it and two people liked it okay good so uh, the the youtube is already there okay uh, if i continue the textbook uh, for this course i will be using lots of material from all over the literature many books many slides from other people but if i like to if you like to use some books and these are some good books uh, about computer vision uh, the first one is the seriski's book let me show you the seriski's book is this one is the seriski's book okay computer vision is kind of old but it talks about the uh, it talks about the basics of computer vision another good book is the 3d introductory 3d material 3d computer vision book this is even older okay uh, the PDFs of these books are available everywhere and one other book is Raj Ramesh Jain but other than that maybe this one is from Forsey and Pons two very well known uh, 
uh, computer scientists. Uh, this is another book. Okay, the contents of these books are somewhat similar, and basic stuff. Uh, I will borrow material from them, and uh, most of the time I will use my own slides and many slides from the other people. I mix up lots of slides from uh, all over the web and I don't want to claim that these are my materials. So whatever I showed you, it is taken from somebody else, you may assume. Uh, since I lost track of where I got them, I don't know, every, every semester I keep changing them too. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a bad thing, but I'm not claiming that these slides are mine. These slides are other people's slides and uh, whoever uh, wrote those slides, I thank them without knowing their names. Uh, for the course requisite, uh, prerequisites, who can take this course? Okay, so I need you to know calculus and linear algebra. Okay, so you took a linear algebra course, you know what the matrix is, you know how to multiply matrices. And from time to time, I will, uh, I will, I will give you that information too. Of course, I am not going to talk about how to multiply two matrices, but uh, we will talk about stuff like, so how do you take the transpose of A times A and B matrices such as that? Okay, so A and B are matrices. How you, so usually you would say this is the same as B T A T. Sometimes you would say this kind of stuff, okay? Uh, and then we will talk about the transformation, like the like the sing singular value decomposition, LU decomposition kind of stuff. You already saw them in your linear algebra classes, okay? Uh, so uh, so you need to know about linear algebra at to some degree. Also, you need to be fluent in C++ and Python, maybe, uh, because we will be using OpenCV uh, library, Open Computer Vision library, that uses uh, C++ and Python uh, uh, as the language. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to do our homeworks. And if you do not satisfy uh, these conditions, talk to me i mean if you are an undergrad student 40 year student i mean you should you should be able to do that if you are a graduate student that means that you have taken uh, your uh, uh, prep prep prep prep if you are not a computer engineer then you have taken your prep courses if you are a computer engineer then you should be able to meet these prerequisites uh, easily Okay, so grading will be like this. There will be a midterm exam. It could be uh, most probably online. Okay, and there will be a final exam. It will be on site. So the university made this decision. They said that in June, when when it when when when it comes to finals time in June at the end of June maybe, okay? They think that this virus thing will go away and we will be able to do the exams on site. And we will have, uh, we will have uh, homeworks, projects homeworks. The grading for the, the weights for the homeworks for the undergraduate students is 40%. For the graduate students it is 30%. Why? Because for the graduate pro, uh, students, uh, I will ask you to choose a paper, one or two papers. You are gonna do the presentation of those papers in a separate lecture to me and your classmates. Also, you do the paper implementation. Okay, so that will be ten percent of your ten percent of your work. This is compulsory for the. for grad students. Even though it is only it looks like it only looks like 10% of your grades, if you don't do your paper implementation and presentation, 
you will not get a passing grade from this course if you are a graduate student. If you are an undergrad and if you like to do this yourself, I may give you a bonus to you if you do the implementation and presentation as an undergrad student. Okay. Good. Any questions on this? Uh, the midterm is going to be online, I said, midterm exam, but it could be a project too. Maybe. The most probably it's going to be an online exam, but it might, it may be a, I may do it a, as a, a assigned project for the midterm. We don't know it yet. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Will we do uh, one of uh, paper implementation and presentation or uh, both? It doesn't say implementation or presentation. It says both. and. Of course, you're going to do both. Okay, grading and homeworks. Um, of course, you need the attend all the classes uh, that's the university regulations and if you if you do not attend uh, maybe do I have the just yeah attendance is here let, let me let me talk about the attendance later first let's talk about the grading and homeworks okay you uh, I don't know I think I will assign four homeworks or five homeworks with this class and you need to complete at least 70% of it. Uh, if you don't submit, if you don't submit uh, uh, enough number of homeworks to satisfy this number, you will get a grade of VF from this course. Okay. Uh, so you need to submit enough number of homeworks. And homeworks are due by the time set by the homework text. And if you are late to submit your homework, we will deduct 10% of the maximum grade from each day late until five days. After five days, you, your, your submission will not be, your submission will not be accepted. Okay, so these are the, these are the rules. And in case something happens that uh, prevents you from submitting your homework on time due to health emergencies or family emergencies then you just let me know before the submission time saying that something this and this happened and I won't be able to submit my homework on time and we will try to work something out for you okay so that's the grading and homework uh, exams again tentatively our online midterm exam will be the eighth week of the semester during class on Monday. So eighth week is, I think, I did this uh, in the morning too, I think April 19th, maybe. This is the first week, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, yeah. Eighth week is this, April, 19th at class time which is 13.30 that will be our midterm exam okay again this is tentatively we will talk about this when the time gets closer to this date at the uh, the week before this one maybe April 12th we will talk about it and we will make that decision okay so you make your preparations according to this this date it won't be earlier than that but we may delay it one or two weeks okay uh, what else again attendance yeah attendance is required I will take the attendance and uh, you don't need to do anything about the attendance you just log in and you you listen to the lectures and whenever i ask you questions sometimes i pick your name from the list 
and I ask you a question, you need to be ready, okay? If you if you don't respond, if you if you just log in and you go away, uh, uh, then that's not going to be that's not going to be good. I will I will take you out of the uh, lecture, and uh, that's not going to be good. So try to be alert and try to ask many questions. Uh, you are responsible from all the subjects covered in the class. Okay, no exceptions. And and um, uh, all the classes, all the subjects that I covered in the class, either verbally or in written way, or anything that I shared with the class pages, teams, or model, you are responsible. Uh, as the university regulations say, if you miss more than 30% of the classes, you will get a grade of an A from this course. VF, if you miss more than 30% of the homeworks, and A, if you miss more than 30% of the classes. Okay. We will do, uh, we will do our announcements uh, uh, about the submissions uh, uh, or the exam announcement, other stuff. I will do it either in the Moodle page or Teams page. Okay, so you are supposed to you are supposed to read them. Okay, from the Moodle or from the Teams. And usually, I, my plan is if everything goes right, I will use Teams most of the time. Okay, but from time to time we need a model okay, because Teams is kept by Microsoft and sometimes university cancels the subscription of our services uh, with Microsoft and in that case we are going to switch the model. But you are supposed to, if, if both of them are active, you are supposed to monitor both of the, both of the uh, pages for this course. Uh, as I said before, as I mentioned before, OpenCV is important for us. Your classwork homework will be done using the OpenCV library. Okay. It has Java interface, it has C++ interface, or it has Python interface. Uh, whichever you use depends on you. Usually people prefer Python. Uh, so, uh, after the class today, just go out and download this OpenCV and compile and play with the sample applications. And soon I will give you, soon I will give you your first homework and you are gonna have a, a good feeling of how the things are done with the OpenCV. Okay, so OpenCV is important. Download it and play with it. There are lots of demos available uh, on the web, YouTube videos, tutorials, etc. Watch them too and they will be useful. And from time to time, when I talk about, when I talk about the techniques that we are going to learn during the lectures, I will try to refer to OpenCV documentation, saying that this is how you do this in OpenCV. This is the parameters. That's the meaning of that parameter, etc. Okay, so it is important to know the details about OpenCV. Good. Honor code, as always, we have the honor code uh, for this course. If you are submitting something as a homework or as an online exam, that work should be 100% yours. I got this. 1% of the homework from somebody else is not a good way of justifying your behavior. Even a single line of code or single line of homework statement is from somebody else that's going to be treated as a cheating. Okay? And we will take action we will take actions accordingly. And usually those actions are not nice both for me and for myself. But if something has to be done it will be done 
don't don't try to don't try to um, test this rule okay I am sure most of you they don't you you you, you don't have any plans about doing that kind of behavior but I have to uh, warn at the beginning of the semester uh, we have no tolerances for that kind of dishonorable behavior at this course good okay and these are the topics most of the text topics that we are going to talk about this class okay First, I will do an introduction to 3D computer vision. Then we will talk about cameras. Then some image processing. Maybe some of you took this image processing course. How many people took image processing course? Just raise your hands. There is a raise hand. One, two, three, 12, what? How do I see it? Oh, there are total of. How do I see it? I have seen only three people's hand. Could you do it again? Raise your hands if you have taken image processing course before. Okay, I am seeing just three. Good. Okay, so it's going to be some overlap with that course and here too then after that when we start talking about stereo and motion and recognition and that kind of stuff okay uh, we will we will talk about the 3d world and everything so it will be different so it is it is it is usual that this course will be will have material that that overlaps with the image processing or pattern recognition or machine learning or deep learning courses okay uh, but uh, usually the stress will be to this 3d computer vision what do i mean by 3d we will try to talk about the 3d properties of the real world that always will be there and if i put the time in it plus t so if it will be maybe four dimensional world when we come to motion okay good so that's it for the uh, syllabus discussion of this course uh, if you have anything any any questions about this course i may answer them right now otherwise i will start talking about the course itself uh, it will be the introduction to computer vision any questions So how many of you are undergrads? Undergrads, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Um, what kind of a stupid interfaces? I cannot, I cannot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay. So half and half. Okay. Uh, usually undergrad students, uh, uh, they get better grades. That's what happens. I don't know. On the average. Okay. Well, good students are good students. It doesn't matter if they are undergrad or grad. But usually the average of undergrads is, is better than the graduate students. Graduate students, usually they have their own uh work and they they give more more importance for their work and etc uh, so uh, i mean the grading between undergrads and grads uh, will not be different they, i will grade them together only the difference is for the graduate students paper reading and presentation is going to be 10 percent so i will not do two i will not do two separate grading tables there will be a single grading table and i will use the same grading rules other than the different weights so is someone asking a question i did not hear it 
Somebody's asking a question. No, this course in English, and you are going to ask it in English. So, what is your question? This is the question. What is the question? This is the question. Uh, if... That was the question. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, you. No, I am not trying to be a negative person by not letting you ask question in in in in in in in Turkish but this course is in English and it is not difficult to ask questions in English I don't expect you to have perfect English grammar or perfect terminology from you why because I don't have the perfect English I make many grammatical mistakes I mispronounce most of the names so if I am doing these kind of mistakes and it is okay for me it should be okay for you too okay so try to ask them in English. That will be a good ex experience for you. And if you do that, you'll realize that asking, talking in English in public is not a difficult thing. You just talk. It is, I and mean, you just ask the question. It is the other part's problem if they don't understand it, okay? It's not your problem. You try to communicate. If the other side doesn't understand you, it's their problem. Okay? If you ask me a question, if I don't understand it, what do I do? I ask it again. Do you mean this? And so we will try to figure it out. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Okay. If there are no questions, let me start doing the real computer vision stuff then. Where is my... Here it is. No. Here it is. Okay, so let's start by defining computer vision. I don't like giving these kind of definitions, actually. I mean, giving these kind of sentential definitions doesn't make much sense. But, but in, I mean, in, in, in, the, in the science world, in the engineering world, usually we give this kind of definitions. This is how we define computer vision. We try to extract we try to deduce descriptions of the real world objects from images or image sequences. You have an image. Okay, this is an image. You input this image to a computer vision system and you get the description out. What is the description? Description could be geometric. For example, uh, you would say that, okay, uh, I have I, I have I have seen a car okay I have seen a car in this picture at this location you will say car and the location that's the geometric description okay size of it I have seen if it's a medical image I have seen a, a vertebra omur in Turkish a vertebra of this size okay so I made a size uh, uh, uh, measurement. Okay, it could be dynamic, uh, the, the, uh, geometric or dynamic. So to be able to make dynamic descriptions, what do I do? I think I need in that case I need a number of images. These are the images. So it is time. I don't have a single image now. I have many many images. In that case, maybe. I have the speed of a car. I would say that this person is walking at the speed or this person's hands are moving at the speed. This person's eyes are moving at the speed, etc. So here the idea is you talk about the real world objects. We don't talk about the artificial image stuff. We talk about the real world objects. We talk about people their sizes, their positions. We talk about the anatomical structures such as this is the lung, this is the tumor that I see on the lung, etc. Okay, so this is the task of the computer vision. Uh, and computer vision is classified as a, as a subfield of artificial intelligence. Why? Because it looks at the images, it looks at the image sequences or videos images or videos 
and it tries to do some uh, information extraction or information deduction from the real world data. Okay, uh, so the problem is a typical artificial intelligence problem. You cannot know everything about the real world by looking at the image of it, right? You cannot know that. You cannot know that. When you look at an image, if the objects are too, too, too small, you cannot know what kind of objects they are, right? If the objects are too fast, you may not measure their speeds. Or the objects are so weird sometimes, you may not know their types. You, you, you may not know their types. So uh, it's a artificial intelligence problem. You, nobody expects you to be successful 100% of the time. But if you have a success rate of 95%, that's good because this is as good as a human does or better than the human does, okay? Better than the human does. Humans usually recognize, I think, 99% of the faces they see, okay? 99% or something like that. Nowadays, we have we have algorithms that does much better than 99% on thousands of people or tens of thousands of people. So nowadays we are doing better than humans in terms of face recognition. Okay. So uh, we used to compare computer vision with the uh, humans. Now uh, we are comparing the computer vision systems with each other because uh, for, for some cases computer vision systems are doing better than the humans. Uh, not all the cases, but for some cases. Okay, uh, so that was the description. Instead of looking at the sentential description, let's look at the areas of computer vision where it is applicable. Okay, let's look at them. One of them is medical applications, very, very important application area. Nowadays, again, it is getting very, very sophisticated. Augmented reality, we will see object tracking, shape pose estimation, industrial inspection, object recognition. Some of these may not make much sense uh, for you right now, but when I show you the uh, images and examples, you are going to uh, see what we mean by them. Okay, maybe let's start with this augmented reality stuff. What do you see? I think this is a satellite image or the aerial image of a city right this is a i think this is the real image this image is taken this image taken from a uav or a, from a helicopter or a, from an air platform i don't know what it is and using the computer vision techniques we determine the positions of the buildings and we place the 3D structures of these buildings on top of the two-dimensional image. For example, there is a tower. So I have a model of the tower and I put my model on top of the original position. This is a stadium and I am doing the same thing with the stadium. Rest of the stadium, I am doing it. So that way, uh, for the Google Earth, this is how they created 3D 3D representations of the 3D representations of the cities. This is a typical computer vision slash computer graphics application and it uses the augmented reality. So why do we call it augmented reality? Can somebody tell me? Why do we call it augmented reality? Because it's not real. So why don't we call it virtual reality then? What is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Augmented reality is projected on the uh, real world, but virtual reality is uh, all virtual space. Exactly, exactly Arda. Uh, with the virtual reality, all the environment is virtual. Nothing is real. With the augmented reality, you have the real image like that one, okay? This is a real image. On top of it, you need to place artificial objects, rendered objects, 
Okay. So the augmented reality has to ha has to use computer vision to recognize the positions of these buildings. After that, it is not just you wouldn't say okay. You wouldn't say this is the place of. Let me try to. Okay. You wouldn't say this is the place of a building. You have to say that, okay? You have to say this also. You need to say that, okay? The uh, This side is 30 meters. Okay, this side is 25 meters. And I am looking at this angle. This is my angle. Okay. And if you need to put a building in here, the building has to have this kind of a shape. So that it looks it looks natural okay like that one okay so it is not a matter of just finding the position also it's a matter of finding the pose of the shape there okay uh, with the augmented reality systems computer vision is the first system so augmented reality uses both computer vision and computer graphics at the same time at the same time Good. Okay, this is one example that uses augmented reality. Uh, this one is another example. This is an old example, but it's a nice one to describe the functions of um, uh, computer vision. Photosynth. Photosynth is this. Um, I think this is a cathedral in somewhere in Europe. People are taking pictures of this cathedral, a lot of them, okay? The idea is this, if I put thousands of different images of the same place into the same system, can I recover the 3D structure of the whole place? The answer is yes. The more images, more better, okay? Uh, for example, our Sultan Ahmed, uh, uh, Sultan Ahmed Square, uh, lots of people are taking pictures of it and they are posting it on uh, uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, on their web pages and etc. If you collect all of those images, okay, if I put them together, it's like this, okay. Let's say I have a building like that. This is a building. Windows, the door and the other windows here. And there's a chimney. There is a person taking a picture from this angle, another person from here, another person there, another person here, and some people taking pictures from the above. If I put them together in a system, can I recover the 3D structure of this building? That's the idea. Okay. So in this case, the the the, the we take these pictures from the tourism tourism uh, pages or the, from the tourists and uh, uh, create the 3D structure of the whole area. Typical computer vision work. Okay, so what do I do here? I I deduce the 3D structure or the position of the building from each image and use all of these images together to create the 3D structure of the real world. Okay, so some interesting applications. Another one, this is a very, very old application of computer vision optical character recognition okay i think this is the first application of computer vision for a man image you try to recognize the digits okay it has many applications like the reading the the license plates of the cars uh, reading the application form letters reading the books and etc right so uh uh, uh, the, the typical computer vision uh, computer vision application but nowadays we don't consider it as a computer vision application anymore because it is solved it is not an applica uh, artificial intelligence uh, problem anymore especially the printed text printed text is, art, uh, is, is, is, is so easy to recognize it is doing better than the humans right now for the written text if i do if i do this written text i wrote written text here if i try to recognize what i had written using a computer program this is not called 
optical character recognition anymore. It is called intelligent character recognition. Intelligent character recognition. ICR. And ICR is still a work of computer uh, vision and artificial intelligence. Okay. Good. Of course, face detection, it used to be a tough thing, uh, like 10 years ago, it was difficult. Nowadays, our cameras, our cell phones, they immediately recognize the faces of people that you are taking images of. They are all implemented in all the cameras. And the nice thing is, they do that too. I mean, it is not face detection anymore we do face recognition. Do you know the difference between detection and recognition, right? Detection is finding the faces. Recognition is, this is a face and this face belongs to Mary, right? So uh, these cameras are doing this. Uh, the newer cameras have pet detection. Okay, so not, not only they recognize the human faces, Okay, they detect the pet faces like the cats and dogs and uh, birds and etc. Okay, that they, they, they, they are doing this. And other than that, uh, what, what else? They are doing smile detection. So if you are taking a picture of this person, you don't take this picture. This is not a good picture, but it's a good picture because the person there, the kid is smiling. So it takes this picture only that person smiles. Okay, so that's a good application of computer vision again. Object recognition is important and it has been used in many places, but nowadays it is not far away. In five to ten years, most of the most of the uh, cashiers and the supermarkets will be gone. Okay, why? Because you know the Amazon stores, right? You just go into this store. There is no Amazon employee working in that store. What you do is, what you do is you go there, you buy, you take your item, whatever you like. Okay. And as soon as you take it and you put in your bag, your charge your you are charged your credit card is charged and you don't you just leave the store that's it okay this is done using what object uh, recognition okay people tracking and motion recognition so if my motion is the buying motion i had to recognize it right so amazon is uh, doing this kind of stuff it will be accepted even more and more. And as I said before, uh, when you go to BIM or A101, uh, in, in five to ten years, you won't see anybody working there. If you see anybody working, maybe they are the people who are arranging stuff, putting new uh, items in the store. Uh, if, if, if they don't do it with the robots, okay? This is what's going to happen. Again, this is computer vision technology. We talked about the face recognition before. This is a picture of a girl, Afghan girl, in 1985. In 1985, a journalist from USA went to Afghanistan during the uh, during the Soviet occupation days in Afghanistan. Okay, he took this picture of this girl. Okay. Uh, she has some uh, uh, uh, impressive eyes and they put this picture on the cover of National Geographic, you know this National Geographic, okay? Then after that they lost track of that girl because there was war and uh, uh, difficult geography. They didn't know who that girl was, they couldn't find it. After a while, uh, when USA went back to Afghanistan again to bomb there and kill more people, Okay, this journalist went to Afghanistan 
and she, he wanted to find that girl and he found somebody this woman okay they didn't know if this is the same person if it is not same or not so what did they do they analyzed the the retinal structure of the girl and they did the same thing with this woman and they find out that these two are the same person this is called person recognition using the iris patterns so by looking at the iris patterns the patterns inside the the iris part of the eye they are unique for each person okay and there was a very good match between this one and this one they said that these two persons are the same nowadays we are using the finger finger fingerprint matching iris matching okay that kind of bio bio bio biometric stuff using computer vision too so the computer vision is important for as a biometric for many fields for example many people they log in without the password right now right because either we use our finger prints fingerprint sensors or we have the cameras uh, that recognize our faces so these are our computer vision stuff again object recognition important in mobile phones object recognition is object recognition is very important uh, if you are using google glass you you use google glass right google glass you point to something with the google glass and it will tell you what object it is and it will find it actually let me try to do that let me try to see if it is going to recognize my camera can i find it yeah it it did it yes it found it it says logitech c920 logitech did you see it oh okay I am showing the same thing to my camera that's my camera yes so i can do that too how about this one just play with it so nice so my tape dispenser did it find it no it didn't find it it didn't know what it is how about my stapler yes yeah, stapler is fine temas zumba wow okay it knows the did you see this this is really temas zumba and this one finds the temas zumba it knows the brand name too I didn't expect it because this is junk. This doesn't work. It even knows the model number. Oh, that's because yeah, okay. That's because <laughs> that because it did the OCR and it found the see? It did the OCR and it found the name on top of it. Anyway, so it is they work very very well. So maybe five years ago seven years ago this kind of an application would have been called impossible okay so it's not for man-made objects only it works for it works for uh, natural objects like this kind of a this kind of a, a plant or this kind of a pet animal okay so these are some interesting applications of computer vision it looks like i am out of time for the first part of the lecture let me take 10 minutes of break. After the break, we will continue. So let's be here around 14.37. 10 minutes of break. İki saatini bitirdim hocam. 
Ee, senin bunları yedin bir tane şundan kaldı. Yemeyeyim ya ben zaten diyetteyim. Şu. Hiç dokunmadım al ana. Al götür hocam bak orada şey de var. Al burada bir yerlerde peçete var. Nerede bak peçete? Ben kaybolmadım. Nerede peçetelerim hocam benim? Ama bu da iyi ayak tutmuş ha. Ha? Ya yani bunları ayak... sayılır. Al hocam eline ya. Biz. Hepsi var. Hepsi. Hepsi var. Evet. Tatlı sana kaldı ha. Tatlı bana kaldı. İstiyorsun bu böyle. Siz dersini veriyorum hocam ya. Hocam bu olmaz böyle şey ya. Niye oluyor ya? Olmuyor işte. Ne oluyor? Hiçbir şey görmüyorum. Duvara şey anlatıyorum. Soruyorum. Sen söyle. Öyle mi demek? Hemen bir tane şey sorsana. Şunu yazın da beş dakika içerisinde de. Ondan sonra onu aç. Bu, bu grup bunu yapmış, bu grup bunu yapmış, bu grup bunu yapmış. Nasıl alacağız? Şey var ya, Teams'in. Teams'in şeyi var ya. Sabrış'ın hikayesi. Ben onu hiç kullanmadım ya. Sabrış'ın. Çok güzel. Ben bir ara yoklama alıyordum onu.
Okay, let's continue. So object recognition is uh, something that computer vision people uh, try to solve uh, for a long time. And we'll talk about the history of the computer vision and we will see it why it is so important. Uh, the, the, the, another application is with the movies and the special effects, you know, shape capture. Uh, you need to know the 3D shape of an object to be able to modify it. Okay. Uh, if you are going to, for example, this is a typical Hollywood movie screen. Okay. Scene. And in that scene, you need to replicate the same person on the same shot but with different facial expressions okay so these are digitally produced you need to have this 3d structure of that person so that you can modify this 3d structure so how do you get the 3d structure you use again computer vision techniques using specialized machinery maybe but again you need the computer vision techniques for that nowadays uh, we have we are seeing the examples of this special effect deep fake you take a real person you put a new face on it and the and the and the and, and the person's facial expressions are done using some other people's faces okay so this is done using regular rgb cameras and uh, people uh, criticized this technology a lot because Many people are believing this, especially for the uh, political area. Uh, you see people are talking with their uh, true faces. They are saying nonsense stuff. And later you realize that these are all fake. Not, not everybody can figure that out. So it is causing some problems, medical problems. Again, this is all done with the computer vision techniques. In sports entertainment business, uh, uh, telecasting okay live casting of the uh, events uh, or the uh, post processing of the events drawing these kind of lines uh, at the sporting events is very common and these are all done with the computer vision techniques again you don't draw this line in an arbitrary way see the line doesn't go over the player it looks like it is drawn on the grass itself and uh, as you see this line here and this line has to be parallel right otherwise it doesn't it doesn't count as um, uh, as as as believable okay and when you do this kind of augmentation on the field itself okay you need to know where the main plane of the field okay and you need to make these measurements. This is 32 meters from to here to there, right? So the running distance. These are very helpful when you do the game analysis. And this has to be done all by computer vision, right? Another application is nowadays smart cards. This is a this is a internal representation of a street of a smart car. When it looks at the street, it finds this. It says that I am seeing one object, a car parked, uh, uh, uh, parked uh, near the street. Okay, this yellow box is the box that covers this car. That then another one. Then I have seen another. I have seen another. Um, car that's in front of me those are the sizes another parked one i have seen a pedestrian inside this box another pedestrian another pedestrian as you see and i am seeing all of these traffic signs okay and each one uh, i know what it means and these are the numbers that kind of give you the confidence about the sign recognition okay so uh, uh, without knowing all that stuff it wouldn't be possible to it wouldn't be possible to uh, navigate your car autonomously throughout these 
kind of crowded scenes as you see it already marked where the buildings are and where the sky starts so it knows about the sidewalk it knows about the road itself and green stuff means that it is the place on the road legally i can drive okay so i could be anywhere within this green part but after that there is a car there i cannot move it even further so if my speed is too high to be able to stop within this green stuff then i need to drop my speed okay so that's another application of computer vision another one is another one is uh, vision based interaction and gaming okay specialized devices sometimes uh, like the kinect camera microsoft kinect it's a specialized camera it, it it observes the people using a depth camera and a regular rgb camera or a leap motion sensor leap motion sensor it is good for the hand movements okay it's not for the whole body but for the hand movements only and using these kind of computer vision based stuff using this kind of computer vision based uh, stuff you can interact with the computers without using any keyboards or mouse okay you are free you move uh, naturally any way you like and the computer vision system recognizes your movements and these are very popular for gaming environments okay we know that vision is used in space a lot nowadays they have landed another rover okay perseverance uh, on mars and i think uh, this week it will start moving uh, as you know landing robots on mars is not a trivial thing why because sending a signal and uh, sending a signal to mars and getting back its answer takes more than 15 minutes okay so you cannot remote look control your robots in there they have to be autonomous okay so by autonomous what do i mean it has to recognize all the obstacles in its way it has to do its own path planning okay and it has to recover the 3d modeling around itself okay and people have been doing this for the last 20 years maybe okay the last one to be sent there as you know it carries a helicopter uh, a, a uav okay on a, a manned uh, aerial vehicle a drone that drone is supposedly is supposed to uh, fly, by, fly, uh, fly by itself and it is supposed to find the landing position automatically and land it land there why because you cannot uh, remotely control those kind of uh, vehicles from earth because delay is too much the delay is too much okay this is another application of course robotics we talked about it uh, uh, the robots has to recognize whatever around them and do the uh, navigation do the interaction with them and computer vision is used in there in the medical world in the medical world uh, first of all the idea is whatever the radiologist can do whatever the radiologist can do we can do it like that okay so what does the radiologist do radiologist takes the this mri or uh, computer tomography image and analyzes the image and say that i see everything normal in this case or sometimes say that i see an abnormal growth at this area of the brain okay further analysis is required that's what the radiologist writes in his or her report right so we can do the same thing with the computer vision nowadays there are expert computer vision systems that are doing as good as and sometimes better than the human counterparts okay this is now possible 
or we can do whatever what the humans cannot do this is a person real image this person is undergoing a brain surgery okay they are going to remove a tumor from the brain a computer vision system sees this person okay using a projector system they draw they draw this picture on top of the skull here so that the surgeon can know where the tumor is exactly located under inside the human skull okay so it sees what the humans cannot see because it can do its reasoning in 3d if everything is registered right it would be very helpful for the it would be very helpful for the surgeon doing the doing the uh, operations okay so i see now we are 18 people uh, for the late comers why did you come late did you think that the class starts at 2 30 could somebody tell me the late comers actually there is 22 in this meeting 22 people yeah there are, there are 22 32, but in the sorry. first part of the lecture there were only 10 people so for the late comers did you think that the class is starting at 2 30. so you you you came late on purpose okay that's fine okay try to be on time because you missed some important uh, information about the lecture so i will i am recording this uh, class and i will post it on youtube you watch the first part of the lecture on youtube okay another another example computer vision application is this very interesting one you gave the computer vision an image and you ask the system to produce a caption like this this is the input this is the output okay it says two dogs play in the grass of course i think it's making a mistake in counting the number of dogs it's not always perfect i think as the first example i gave you i gave you a, a, the, the bad ones okay let's look at the good ones a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road okay this is one example good a group of young people playing a game of frisbee nice okay this this is a very good ex actually example what did i say computer vision is an artificial intelligence problem if i show you that's just this picture I am just showing you this picture. What would you say? How would you caption this picture? Two people fighting. Two people fighting maybe. Yeah, okay. They are definitely playing. They are definitely playing, right? Um maybe wrestling but they are playing because they are on a field game field it is grass and their clothes are sporting clothes we know that okay so it's a difficult problem as soon as you see this frisbee here right you understand that okay this is a game of frisbee also i recognize this cone here cone is a good sign for the frisbee frisbee game okay and if you are familiar with the frisbee games maybe this is easy to caption after that okay so what did i say you don't have the complete information artificial intelligence problem you make good guesses and uh, and i don't know i mean how many out of how many people are there in the world now six billion six billion maybe right out of six billion how many of them do you think would say that this is a frisbee game 
I would say that most a few hundred million right a few hundred million maybe so uh, uh, so it's a difficult problem most of the people wouldn't know it okay so there are other bad cases this one says a close-up of a cat laying on a couch yeah it's a cat but it is not laying it's just sitting uh, other bad examples how about this one a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot I don't know what would you say for this picture but <laughs> well it is not correct it's not a yellow bus I don't know what it is yeah this one is refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink <laughs> yeah okay sometimes it just goes crazy so this is I think two years old and nowadays it is doing much better so the current state of the art is this uh, many of these applications are less than 10 years old and in, in the next five years uh, uh, we will see we will see much more so sophisticated computer vision applications and most of the time we, the computer vision systems will do better than will perform better than humans in terms of reliability in terms of efficiency in terms of speed Murat you have a question uh, yes uh, a young people uh, uh, a young uh, group a, a group of young people is enough at uh, three people uh, should should uh, should it uh, say three people playing a game of frisbee uh, uh, but that's a that's a good question so you ask this question to many people and some of them answered the answered it as a group of young people playing a game of frisbee some people say that people playing frisbee some people say that people playing on the grass so i mean what what would be the perfect uh, a caption for this image I, I don't know so it is really difficult to it is really difficult to measure your correctness uh, with this kind of application it's like uh, doing a translation if you translate a sentence from English to Turkish okay how many ways are there to make this translation okay especially if the sentence is long or if you are translating a paragraph okay uh, literally I can come up with hundreds of different ways of translating it right which one is the best one I don't know because I am doing it all myself with the NLP world, uh, natural language processing world, this is one of the biggest problems because there is no definite answer, right? There is no definite answer. The previous problems, like this one, the radiologists usually agree with each other, or or or this one. If it's a car, it's a car, right? If it's a person, it's a person. I know that. So it's a traffic sign. I know it's a pedestrian uh, passage. Okay, so uh, I know these. These are all hundred percent uh, true statements. But with the natural language world, there is no there is no thing such as this is the answer of your natural language query, and I will not accept anything else. No, we don't have such things in natural language processing world. So this is a joint technology between computer vision and natural language processing. Okay, so we looked at the state of the art and I think I, I, I hope you have some kind of an idea what computer vision does uh, uh, and uh, how we define it and uh, uh, uh, it's a very rapidly developing area it always it it it it it, it always have been very important has been very important many people worked on it but nowadays it is burning okay everybody is trying to get something out of it uh, because everybody wants to do some application about computer vision or 
They like to use ideas comp from computer vision in their own areas such as bioengineering or chemical engineering or uh, or mechanical engineering, civil engineering. They like to borrow these kind of ideas from computer vision world and apply it to their uh, own purposes. That's why this is a very hot area and uh, you, you are making a good decision by taking this course. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions, let's try to define the computer vision in terms of other fields. Let's look at, let's try to compare them with the other fields. Image processing. Okay. What is the relationship between the computer vision and image processing? There, there is there is a lot of overlap between computer vision and image processing and sometimes they are used interchangeably usually with the image processing they deal with the image properties or image to image transformations for example this is a, on the left side this is a blurry image this is a sharper image there is an operation image processing operation which is called sharpening. I am sharpening the image or I am blurring the image. Okay, so with these kind of operations, your input is an image, your output is another image. So image to image transformation. Many examples of it, image enhancements like the sharpening or image compression. I will give you a one megabyte image and you are going to give me a hundred kilobyte image with the same image qualities. Okay, so this is a, a, a, a one tenth uh, uh, compression ratio and very successful. But again, your input is an image, your output is an image. Or image restoration. I have an image where there are lots of scratches and uh, spots, bad spots, and I like you to fix it, to make it more natural. Okay. So these are all image in image out operations, and usually image processing does this. With the computer vision, in all of these applications, okay, you get a description of the real world object. This is a natural language description. In this case, this is the position of the tumor and the description of the tumor. In this case, position of the ball, position of the nearby rocks. Okay, again, the same, similar. Position of the human hands and body parts and their speeds. Position and the speeds of the nearby objects and their types, etc. The outputs are usually all descriptions of the real world objects, not another image. Okay. If you are producing another image, okay, and if doesn't if it doesn't contain any uh, uh, description of the real world stuff, then you are doing image processing. So, image processing and computer vision share uh, lots of literature, lots of techniques together. But computer vision says that I am going to extract 3D structure of the world or descriptions of the world, geometric or dynamic. Another one is the computer graphics. This one is very, very related to computer vision. And sometimes people refer to computer vision as compu inverse computer graphics. Inverse computer graphics. Okay, why? Because in computer graphics, they give you the descriptions of the real world. They say that, okay, they say that I have a plane, a plane, a 3D plane, okay, it's normal, normal angle is this, its position is this, and then I have a ball, size is this, and I have two light sources with this color and etc. Now what are you going to do? 
given the description of the real world, produce me an image of that real world. Okay, so that's what the computer graphics does. It takes a it takes a description of the real world objects and it produces the image of the uh, real world corresponding to that description. Computer vision just does the inverse of it. You take the image and you produce this description. That's why if something is inverse of the other, then then that means that uh, that means that these two are very very related. Okay. Uh, Yusuf, you are asking a question. You, we, we cannot hear you, Yusuf. Your voice is so weak. Come closer to your microphone. All right, I'm actually close to my microphone, but if it's still bad, I can write. No, no, no, it is good now. Okay, um, I didn't know it, that they, they were related, so would you recommend taking uh, computer graphics with uh, this lesson? Yeah, the, it would be a perfect fit. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah. As you're going to see, camera modeling is going to be very, very, very, very similar. Because using the camera models, we try to understand how the real world positions are related to the images that we see. Computer graphics people, they use the camera models to model how to produce those graphics. Okay, so they are very, very related. But computer graphics uh, as, a, as, a, as a fundamental area is not an artificial intelligence area, okay? Computer vision is. Because with the, with the computer graphics, everything is, everything is unambiguously given as description like that, okay? And there is one way to produce it realistically. But with the, with the, with the computer vision, it is difficult to interpret these kind of scenes. If I give you this scene, what would you say? How would you describe it? There is a ball on a surface. There is a ball on a surface, right? Uh, and there is a, a green light and a red light. I said that you could you could say that, but also I would say that this is a two-dimensional two-dimensional painting. Okay or it is not a ball but it is a coin maybe with different colors etc so we are going to see some examples of it so trying to extract three dimensional properties from two dimensional images is not is not a trivial thing it is most of the time ambiguous you you, you can come up with many different descriptions Okay, what else? Pattern recognition. Again, uh, it is the task of classification of patterns into final set of pre-specified pre pre classes. Okay, with the pattern recognition, your input is not only the images. There could be two-dimensional, one-dimensional data. For example, sound data, voices. Uh, you may you may you may refer to them as patterns. Okay, and you classify them into a finite set of classes. That's pattern recognition. Photogrammetry is a very old uh, area. People uh, use this photogrammetry area to draw maps, okay, from the pictures, and that's why it is very old, from the end of uh, 19, uh, 1800s, okay, and um, their purpose is to measure very precise measurements of the real world so that they can draw maps okay so they don't want to recognize stuff but they like to do the measurements this, this is what what's called photogrammetry so this is another way of looking at computer vision we try to we try to compare that compare it to the we try to compare it to the uh, other 
areas uh, such as computer graphics, image processing, etc. Any questions? Okay, I hope these are making some sense. Okay, I kept talking about images and images and images, and let's talk about what the, what an image does for us. Okay, as a computer vision. Okay, we are talking about the images, and we are going to talk about how we form these images. This is a definition of an image. It is as simple as this. For us, an image is a two-dimensional matrix of numbers. That's it. Two-dimensional matrix of numbers. Okay? It's like that. Look at these numbers. These numbers will vary between 0 and 255. Okay, that's our decision. That means that each number can fit into one byte. Okay? Each one can fit into one byte. And... Um, corresponding to each number is a intensity intensity lower the number darker the intensity higher the number uh, uh, brighter the intensity the image that corresponds to these matrix of numbers is this one what kind of image is this do you recognize it by image it's an human eye right Right eye or left eye? Right eye, I guess. I think it is right eye, yeah. Maybe it is. Yeah, it is right eye. I don't know, but it's an eye, right? It's an eye. So, uh, as you see, this 117 corresponds to this corner, right? And this very very low number what is the lowest number that you see here it is 15 or 13 right there is 13 here this 13 i guess it corresponds to this dark area here okay so if i show you intensities lower intensities for lower numbers higher intensities for higher numbers an image is formed of course, this is for human weaving only. Okay, this is for human weaving only. This is for the machine. The machine sees it like this matrix. So if if you are to if your task is to recognize what object I have in this image, you are going to get this, you are going to get this matrix, and you are going to output a label I, human I maybe. Okay. So your computer vision system will get this matrix and its output will be a class of human eye. Good. Okay, so this is about an image for us. Of course, this is not the only uh, uh, image type. There are many other image types and we are going to look at them one by one. But whatever we do, we will not get away from this picture. The, the picture is we will have some kind of a matrix of numbers okay and sometimes this matrix would be a three-dimensional matrix sometimes i would put the time dimension in it too but we will have these kind of numbers in there and usually each one each pixel and each one is called a pixel pixel pixel means do you know what pixel is do you know what is the pixel is short form of it's an abbreviation of what picture element? Picture element, yes. Picture element. Sometimes they call it PAL. Picture element, PAL. Sometimes they call it picture element. Uh, and correspondingly, there is voxel. Voxel is volume, volume element. Okay. Pixel, voxel. Sometimes there is this edge, edge element. Okay, edge element. Uh, they made up these kind of uh, terminologies. So pixels are going to be there, and usually for each pixel, we use one byte. 
okay because that's convenient one byte is eight bits so it can represent between 0 to 255 but that's not the always case sometimes for each pixel we use three bytes sometimes four bytes depending on the image type is going to change good okay so this is a light intensity image this is a light intensity image there are other types of images i have two dimensional matrix each one corresponds to an intensity in this one some images each number corresponds to a range let's look at that one for example okay tell me what you see in this image it's a very blurry image but um, just tell me what you see what is this image can you tell me what kind of environment is this outside environment is outside environment is it looks like an, an office or a waiting room or yeah it yeah. looks it there, looks like an kind of a chair and some cupboards exactly i don't know what it is but it looks like a waiting room some kind of an office in the middle of the office there is this large object i don't know what it is but it is closer to me and these are some cabinets maybe a door i don't know so this is an intensity image let's say this is like that this is 100 pixels here and 100 pixels there okay 100 by 100 there are 10,000 uh, bytes in this image and i think here the numbers are maybe 200 and here the numbers are at the okay the blue one is the blue part here is the blue part the numbers are like uh, 200 in the red part the numbers are like maybe 10 20 right that's it how about this image let me put them side by side it says range image take a guess what is this it corresponds to the same environment and it is taken at the exact position it's an image again but it's not a it is not an intensity image but it's a range image what do we mean by range image it makes objects darker that is closer to the camera exactly it's an image that represents the positions by the range to the camera okay here the the red point here is the closest to the camera its value is 10 okay and so it is very close but the blue part for example here is far away from the camera its values are maybe 200 or anything it looks like there is a look at this green part here this part in the middle it's very bright so it is 250 or something like that so it is far away from the camera range image so this is the image type that we see a lot because our cameras on our cell phones like this okay my cell phone camera it takes intensity images but this is a specialized camera this camera can detect how far the objects are okay how far the objects are by looking at this camera i know that the closest object on the floor is this one okay and also see at the top of the room there is another close object it is close to me right is close to me and also i know that by looking at this picture maybe there is a hole uh, inside that room i don't know and this part is definitely uh, away from me so it's a range image again this is a hundred by hundred image but each pixel 
represents the depth from the camera range from the camera depth image or range image okay I am trying to make this point of there are different types of images not all images are intensity images okay some images are range images or depth images there are specialized cameras to produce this kind of a to produce this kind of an image yet another type of images physical property images for example this MRI images what image is this what human part do you see here It looks like a knee, right? But you have never seen such a knee before, right? Because it, it looks like somebody has sliced knee in the, uh, uh, uh, just uh, just uh, just uh, in the middle, and they are showing us the sliced version of the knee, right? Of course, they did not slice anybody. They didn't hurt anybody. They took the MRI image of the person. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. MRI, MRI uh, exposes the subject with very high magnetic fields and it measures the disturbance in the magnetic fields that comes from the human part and it makes a guess what is happening inside the human's body okay so it is basically it is measuring the hydrogen amount inside the human body for each point and it is inherently three dimensional technology so two dimensional numbers like that okay let's say this is 100 by 100 but then they stack them together 100 there too okay So this is 100 by 100 by 100 volume now. And if I take this slice, this blue one, take it out and look at like a two dimensional image, I get this one. So each pixel here is representing the hydrogen content of the corresponding uh, anatomical structure inside the human body so it is not intense it is not depth it is hydrogen content instead of MRI if I use the x-ray then in that case I am measuring how transparent that point with respect to the x-rays okay you pass you release some x-rays towards the human body at the other end of the human body you measure how much of them has passed through the body and you form an image this image measures the x-ray amounts okay so this is our third image type I am not saying that there are only three image types there could be many more but at the end we will end up having this two or three dimensional matrices and these are going to be called images two dimensional images or three dimensional images what are you looking for what you call esra altun esra altun i think she is taking most of the classes <laughs> what <laughs> Bir, onun kararını verdik hocam biz geldi o ya er, Erdoğan'a baktı ona. Uh, so uh, as I said before uh, two or three dimensional images are in and we are going to suppose we are supposed to produce the real world representations of real world descriptions of those images whatever is contained. I think I'm out of time again for the second part of the lecture of today. I will take 10 minutes of break. After the break, we will continue. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, 
I think in uh, 28 um, slides, uh, there was a, a distance, a range image. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in photogra photographs, we uh, the image reduced by a, a, a lens uh, on the um, image sensor. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, in that depth image, uh, how can we um, how can we um, how, how can we get this image by yeah. uh, uh, distance sensor? Um, because there is no lens for distance. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the camera technologies usually differ. Uh, there are many types of range image cameras. One type is the active type. We call it active vision cameras. It is based on laser. They shine a laser, okay? And they measure the amount of time of the travel. These are called time of flight cameras. Time of flight cameras tof okay these time of flight cameras <coughs> these time of flight cameras they use a special wavelength uh, laser to release the laser and uh, wait until the laser come back okay and they do it very very fast 20 frames per second 60 frames per second they can measure the uh, depth the the the, the different versions of it, for example, LIDAR, do, did you see this? Laser, laser, uh, laser uh, uh, it's like radar, but it's LIDAR, okay? Uh, you do the uh, radar idea using the lasers, we call it LIDAR. LIDAR is doing the same thing to using a laser to scan around and use the time of uh, flight again. But these are active sensors, there are passive sensors too, with the passive sensors, usually they use more than one camera. They do the triangulation. In fact, we are going to talk about this triangulation stuff for maybe two, three, maybe four weeks in this in this in this in this semester. Uh, it's called stereo. Sometimes uh, depth from motion. There are many ways to do this measurements, and of course, they are not as easy as getting this image. But there are very good ways of doing it. Let me show you. Let me see if I can get some. Okay, so time of flight cameras. Okay, one of them is this is a stereo camera. As you see, one of them is a projector, the others are cameras again stereo this is called this one is called interferometer okay again uh, very very precise three-dimensional measurement stuff these are all depth stuff can i see yeah these are very popular hundred dollar stuff depth cameras and most of them are based on time of flight stuff and uh, I think it's going, they are going to get very cheap. And I think, yeah, the latest iPhones and the iPads, they have these cameras too. Uh, so if, if, uh, if you combine these two images, uh, we have a, we have a, um, we have an image with a distance data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, but, uh, in our school, is there a camera like that? You can use? Sure, yeah. I have, uh, we have the Kinect the, uh, cameras, we have the leap motion cameras, and if you like, so if you like that, uh, uh, so if you like it, I will, uh, I mean, I will assign one or two homeworks about this to you. Okay, good. 3D is exciting, actually. Uh, we have those kind of cameras, and, and those are not magic, I mean, the idea is that, okay, why don't I start by look, talking about them in my next lecture? Let's take a break. It is, let's, let's be here around 30, 15, 39, and I will talk about stereo. And you'll see that those are not, those are not very complicated cameras. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, hello everybody, I am back. Okay, so um, Doha has asked this question, how does this these types of cameras work? Let me try to construct a very simple camera that does the depth imaging. Uh, let's say instead of 3D world, we have two dimensional world. And there is, a, there is an object like this. There is an object, a rectangular object, okay. And this is my camera here. Usually we do this, okay? If this is my camera, this is the center of projection. This is how the images are formed. The the image, the, the light ray follows this path here. And this green dot appears on this position. And this, let me do the this I will do the same thing again but I made a mistake sorry I didn't do the green right okay and this black dot follows this line and this so I guess that's that's enough so the I will need to do okay so like this so the image of red dot is here and the image of green dot is here right that's how my object looks on my on my on my camera by looking at this picture I cannot say anything about the depth of this red dot or the green dot. But if I have another camera like that, okay, if I have a cam another camera like that, what I do is, what I do is, if this is my central projection, if I do this projection here, my green dot appears here, and my red dot is going to appear here 
okay their positions change and their their positions on the same object change if you look at this if you look at this green triangle if you look at this green triangle it's a triangle if i know this green triangle part and if i know this one and if i know this one i can calculate this height right So this is basically triangulation. If you take the picture of the same scene from two different angles by using this triangulation principle, you can find the depth of that point from the camera. That is the H. That's the idea. So if you use two cameras, like many of them in these pictures as you see it has two eyes two eyes two where is two eye one is here one is there yeah two eyes and two eyes okay if you have more than one eye then triangulation is possible using this triangulation principle you can find the depths of the objects is this kind of is this kind of clear Dora? yeah thank you okay so we will come back to this idea uh, and we will talk about this for a few for a few weeks actually with the stereo chapter and before that even okay okay good so uh, images types are different that's what we talked about again um, since these are the images let's talk about how the images are formed especially for the intensity images we are going to look at them okay so for any computer vision task we need to know how an image is formed okay uh, we need to ask this question to ourselves how can we model this so the idea is this let's say this is my camera and there is a lens in front of it and behind the camera there is the sensor okay this is the sensor and this is my lens and this is the picture this is the object that I look at in the real world okay let's say this object is X Y Z the coordinates of this objects top point is X Y Z so how would I see it? It would be at this position. It would be small case, okay? Small case that is X and Y. I like to find a mathematical expression, closed form expression, that that that ties this X Y Z to X Y. In the real world, this one leaves at position 100 millimeters, 101, 72, and 57. This is, this, let's say, these are the coordinates of my object in terms of millimeters in the real world. And here, this one corresponds to 10th column and 71st, 71st, 71st, uh, um, row okay in my image so what is the mathematical expression m that ties this three-dimensional world to the, this two-dimensional image position matrix position that's what i am trying to find that's one thing okay this is the geometric modeling this is the geometric model image geometry the second one is photometric parameters if this position is in the real world is bright and i can measure the brightness using some kind of a metric how would it appear on my image what would be the value between 0 and 255 okay if this position have such and such color how would i see it on my image that's called uh, photometric parameters okay so that's the photometry 
Image geometry tells you about the x, y, z's. Photometric parameters tells you about the intensities. And then we have quantization and sampling. This one lives in a continuous world, okay? Everything is continuous. There is, There are no integers in the real world, okay? Everything is continuous. But on my image, I have columns and rows, right? I have columns and rows. So I have to do some quantization and sampling. I have to divide that intensity between 0 and 255, but I have to divide it, okay? I have to discretize it. So there is discretization of the intensity. Also, there is a discretization of the geometric positions. I have to do that. So to be able to form these images, I have to be careful about these three aspects of image formation. Geometry, photometric parameters, and quantization and sampling. We will pay most attention to our image geometry. That's the most important for us. Okay. Of course, photometry and the quantization and sampling are important too. But usually they are kind of, this one is very, very solved problem. This one is, uh, uh, uh, for the computer vision world, we can generally ignore them. But image geometry is very important. At the base, at the fundamental level of the image geometry is the projection. Look at this picture. What do you see? This is one of the illusions called optical optical illusions. Can somebody tell me? Can somebody tell me what you see in this picture? It's a cube of torch. Doha, could you tell me again what do you see? Uh, it's a cube of earth. I did. They draw it in, in a road. Yeah, it's a it's a road painting, and it is it is painted in a way that it gives us this illusion of there is one big sphere shaped like a world and somebody is cleaning on top of it but in fact this is what is happening right okay it's a two-dimensional picture actually on the sidewalk okay so this projection actually i mean projecting the three-dimensional information to 2d projecting the three-dimensional information to 2D is happening here too. Since we are losing one of the dimensions when we do the projection, of course we are going to have these kind of illusions, especially if they are done in purpose, if they, especially if they are done in purpose. So at the, at, the, at, the, at the fundamental level of the geometric modeling of our cameras, is this projection and we need to model it using our linear algebra techniques and we are gonna see it okay so let's look at how an image formed using our regular image formation process okay we are going to design a camera okay we have a film by film i mean Let's let's let's let me try to let me try the film. Let me try to define the film. Film is an electronic device. It has these kind of sensors. This is sensor number one, sensor number two, three, four, five, six. That that that. Let's say I have total of hundred sensors in this two-dimensional world, and my film is one-dimensional. So. This one produces values between 200, 0 to 255. This one is an electronic device. Okay. If it doesn't receive any light, it will produce 0. If it receives lots of light, it will produce 255. Okay. So, the, so I have a total of 100 of them. As you see, this is a two-dimensional world. My object is two-dimensional. Okay. And my film is one-dimensional. To make it more uh, uh, explainable. So, the sun 
let's say sun is here sun okay the the light the light coming from the sun hits this part of the object and there are infinitely many light rays reflected from that position right and some of those light rays hit my fan and as you see equal number of rays hit different parts of my fan okay from this point also from this point from this point infinite number of rays hit my film again from this point so my film cannot form an image why because it is getting all kinds of reflections from all parts of this object so this part this sensor is going to measure all the light rays coming from let's say from this part too right or from this part too so it is going to measure everything and there will be no difference between sensor to sensor all the sensors are going to produce the same number maybe they will produce 200 so what i am going to see is a flat image a constant image flat image okay so this is not a very good camera because it doesn't form an image all the let's say this is a two-dimensional image this is a three-dimensional world this 100 by 100 image will contain only 200 number 200 that's it that's not a good image so how do i make an image how do i make a camera this is the idea this is the idea i don't want let's say for this point other than the other than the other than the black line i don't want to see all the other all the other rays i don't want to see them i want to see only the black line for this one i don't want to see anything other than the blue line okay so that we are going to define we are going to design a camera like that and they have luckily they have designed such cameras 2000 years ago and it is called pinhole camera this is the idea very simple okay uh, of course our camera is something like that maybe use the maybe use the okay so it doesn't receive any light there is a pinhole in front of the camera there is a pinhole in front of the camera that pinhole is so small that only a single light ray can pass through from a direction as you see uh, uh, uh, from all the light rays reflected from this point the red point only one ray can pass through and it hits it hits at this point red point from all the blue rays infinitely many blue rays only one of them can pass through and it is to this position and from all the black points only this one can pass through and it forms the black point so what am i gonna get is if this is my object right i am going to get that object like that okay good so the that, that's the basic idea of a camera pinhole camera that's the pinhole camera and this was invented this one was invented uh, people know this people know about this 2000 years ago and this one was used and i'm going to show you a few examples of it 
Of course, 2000 years ago, we did not have these light sensors, electronic light sensors, right? Nowadays, we have them. If I put those sensors, if I put those sensors, let me move this from here to there. Okay, if I put these sensors behind this film, okay, this one will measure how much light it receives from this red dot from the real world. This one will measure the blue uh, points uh, light waves and this one will measure the red points light waves, okay? So electronically, I can I can do this again. This is two dimensional world and one dimensional film, but in the real world, this is going to be three dimensional world and two dimensional film. Okay. Good. That's the idea of pinhole camera, and this one really works. Actually, this is a real camera. This is one really works. This opening is important. Assume that. Assume that. Uh, this hole is not this small but this hole is maybe this small okay what happens tell me what kind of image would you see with this kind of aperture with this kind of hole that hole is called aperture I check look in Turkish tell me what would you see with that kind of hole There will be a blue image. Exactly. Why? Because out of all the blue, out of all the blue, out of all the blue rays, many of them will pass through, and all the blue rays will make not a single dot, but a large disk. So my image will be blurred. Okay, right? My image will be blurred. So that aperture has to be small, as small as possible. Why don't we make it very, very, very small? Okay, why don't we make it very, very small? Well, in that case, there are some other certain problems, like the interference of the light. Uh, I am sure you, you will remember this from your high school lectures or from your physics lectures. I don't know if you, if you have seen it. And we are going to look at some of these examples. So. There is an optimal opening. There is an optimal aperture size for different cameras, and we are going to talk it uh, talk about it. Okay. So as you see, our image is upside down. That's the characteristics of these kind of cameras. So question: What did they do when? Okay. When is the? What time is the? What date is the first uh, photograph taken? The first photograph taken, a French guy. Take a guess. The first, the, the first photograph. 1900s, 1800s, or 1700s? 1800s. Beginning of 1800s or at the end of 1700s? So, if I, if I type it in here, first photograph, first photograph is, yeah, this one, 1827, 26. And this is the first photograph, actually. So, this one is first photograph from the rooftop. Okay, this is the first photograph. So they didn't have the electronic sensors. What did they have then? Okay, instead of an electric sensor, they placed a sheet of film here that is chemically sensitive to light. Okay, if it receives light, it goes into a chemical reaction with the light and it changes its color. Okay, it changes its color. Uh, so if you if you expose that chemical uh, material to more light, it becomes white. 
otherwise it becomes dark. That's how they did it in the beginning of the 1800s. Okay, beginning of the 1800s. Good. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the main idea. So if this is the main idea, then we can write mathematical expressions to find the given the x y z position of this uh, point. We can find the x y of the point on the film. Okay, this is called camera obscura. Aristotle know about this. The the the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Okay and everybody knew about this phenomenon but they didn't have that chemical film at the uh, during those days so they couldn't create the they couldn't create the photographic the, the camera or they didn't have ele electronic light sensors okay electronic light sensors so again this is the three-dimensional representations of it as you see there is a bunch of light rays coming from this point and this is the aperture size it's like a disc like that right so each point is represented by a disc like that so this image is a little bit blurry because this uh, opening here is larger than infinitively infinity in, infinitively infinitely small whatever it is okay so let's look at some of the some of the gadgets people have built and these are real gadgets okay so look at this look at this picture and tell me what do you see this is real experiment yes this is not experiment somebody is doing their job a painter yeah. uh, painter paints uh, what uh, what image um, font uh, coming from a pinhole and it's a reverse and yes, upside down, right? It's upside down. So this painter built this box. This box is, I guess, right? This box is maybe three meters by three meters by three meters, I guess, right? He he uh, he goes into this box. He puts his white paper on this wall okay and he positions his box so that uh, it is aimed towards the destination using some kind of a maybe pencil he is drawing the main geometry of the scene right so he is going to steal the geometry from the nature later he's going to paint it so geometry is going to come from the light rays. That's what he's doing. They used to do this a lot during the during the days. Okay. So they they have the geometry for free. They don't have to make any calculations. How would this tree be placed on my image? No, they don't have to do that. Okay. So this is one example. The other example is this one. They have. They have sold this kind of stuff, 1500s, 1600s, uh, 1800s, okay? In this case, this guy places his paper on this flat surface, okay? Makes it dark, and the pinhole is here. He draws, he draws uh, whatever he sees on the white paper. Again, the image is upside down, but later he it transposes his his image okay so these are two real gadgets that were built uh, a few hundred years ago okay when they invented this when they invented this uh, 
light sensitive chemical materials on film on papers then they started producing they started producing images but how about the aperture what would be the aperture size i don't know somebody made this somebody made this experiment he said that if i make my aperture two millimeters large diameter this is the image if i make my aperture one millimeters this is the image 0 0.6 and 0 0.35 so far it gets it gets sharper and sharper right the smaller the aperture sharper the image but if i go on and make it even more sharper even more smaller the image doesn't get even sharper no it gets diffracted okay and my image is distorted this is bad and this is bad too so the optimal opening is this optimal opening is this so the pino camera works this way and there are people there are people actually taking images with pinhole cameras pinhole camera pinhole camera images yeah yeah some examples of pinhole cameras this is a example pinhole camera where is it yeah this one an old camera but you can do the pinot camera experiment with this kind of newer cameras too all you do is you cover your lens mount with a paper and you put a small hole in it right so it becomes a pinot camera for you so you put your film or you put your uh, you put your film or you put your um, um, um, CCD behind it and you, it becomes a pinhole camera and in fact you can do the same experiment with your cell phone where is my cell phone uh, where is my cell phone yeah here it is okay with my cell phone my cell phone doesn't focus very well if it is very close I am going to make a pinhole camera with my cell phone you do the same experiment with me Okay, get your cell phone and get a piece of paper like that. Which camera can do you see? Do you see it? Do you see my paper? Is this the camera yes. that you are seeing? Okay, so I am going to put a dot like that. Okay, now it is, there is a hole. Okay, and then I paint the re uh, I paint the the surrounding region with a pencil so it is dark. Where did it go? Where is my? Okay, here it is. Okay, so I am going to convert the camera that you used to look at me to a pinhole camera, like that so I cannot get even closer to you yeah can I get even closer no because if okay so this is a pinhole camera and you are going to see my fingerprint maybe no you cannot let me try to show you okay a pinhole camera and as you see see you can read very very close uh, letters for you and still you can see it if you can read pinhole camera now if I remove it you cannot see anything because it is all blurred it is not pinhole anymore okay and you can do the same thing with your eye if you have if you if you if you if you if you are uh, uh, far-sighted if you are far-sighted like myself 
Okay. We call them hypermetropy in Turkish. Farsighted. You do this and you make a small hole with your finger like that. And everything becomes very, very sharp. I can read it. But without that, I cannot read it. Or remember this one? I can put it in, in front of my eye and now I can read stuff. I can even read from this position. I think this this hole is so little that's why I cannot see it. Let me make this hole larger. Now Now I just went the opposite way. I think it was too big. <laughs> Let me make it smaller. No. Okay, now. You guys are doing the same experiment with me? Huh? This is too small. I cannot see anything. And uh, I can only read uh, when I don't have glasses like that. Are you nearsighted or farsighted? Farsighted. If you are farsighted, uh, using this experiment should work for you. I mean, make yeah. a small thing. Yeah. Okay. That's why. That's why many people, those uh, nearsighted people, to see nearsighted people, to see far away, they do this, right? They squint their eyes. When they squint their eyes, they are making their eyes uh, a pinhole camera. They are reducing this. Uh, they are reducing this uh, aperture. So if you reduce this too much, then you get this. If it is big, you get this. So with that experiment, I was trying to do that. So my optimal, my optimal dot is something like that. I guess this is the optimal dot for me. So if I do it again no this is two two yeah do it and show you the other one let it go see it is like magnified did you see it letters but if I remove this one you don't see it you don't see anything anyway so uh, this is this is how the aperture works this is how the pinot camera works pinot camera is nice and people make these kind of these kind of cameras and they take images with the pinot cameras and these are some of the images that are taken with the pinot camera see very nice image. Different feelings of it. That's why people like it. Okay. So uh, practical cameras. But there is a problem with the pinhole camera. The problem is the pinhole is so small. If it is small, then I cannot gather image uh, enough light. If I cannot gather enough light, then I have to wait until my sensor or my chemical film uh, is exposed enough. So that's not going to be good because if I have to, if I have to wait ten minutes to take a picture, so that uh, enough amount of light passes through my pinhole, okay. That's not going to be enough. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I am going to do this. I am going to use a lens. Okay. This is the lens solution. We make my aperture very, very large. Okay. Let's say this is my box again. Okay. This is my box. And I put, I made my aperture very large and I put a, I put a thin lens 
at the opening of that uh, uh, pinhole camera what is what are the properties of till lenses till lenses they do this all the all the all the light rays coming from the same point are focused at the same point that's what the till lenses do okay so all the red light waves hitting on this lens will be focused at the same point on the film okay and i am doing the same thing all the blue waves light waves they will be focused at the same point but as you see these are these are trying to go all the way and meet at this point so their focus point is here not there right so although you are going to see a single red dot at this point your blue dot will be like a circle it's going to be blurry so thin lenses are very good in terms of getting more light to your image but we have the problem of focusing if you are not focused to some point okay if you are not focused to some point then other parts of your objects will be appearing on your image as blurry okay so in this configuration i am focused on this red dot not the blue one or not the green one both blue one and the green one will appear as blurry on my images okay on my images did you so that's the part of the lens lens are good for getting more light but getting more light means that i have the problem of unfocused images i didn't have this unfocused image problem with the with the uh, pinhole camera why because it doesn't matter how far my um, object is only a single light ray will pass through from my system with the thin lenses many light rays can pass through but they may not guarantee to focus on the same image image image image image frame okay good you understand it okay good any questions any questions so how would i know how would i know where this focusing is going to be can somebody tell me how would you let's say i am the distance here to here is let's say uh, d1 okay and distance uh, from here to there is d2 how is d1 and d2 related can anybody tell me Uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, curve of the lens, I guess. No, no. Give Radius. me the give me the mathematical formula to relate d1 to d2. You know this. Isn't the d2 is st sh stable? Yeah, we, you may assume that both of them are uh, they don't change. I am. My scene is uh, not changing, it is static. What I say here is that D1 is related to D2. Okay, tell me the formula about D1 and D2. You know this, they teach you, they teach you this formula from your primary school. They teach you this formula and you will never know where you're going to use it and 
in your life this is the first time you need that formula and you don't remember it thin lance law do you remember it thin lance law ince ince kenarlı mercekler kuralı neydi Bir şey daha mümkün değil hatırlamıyorum şu anda. 1 over f is d1 d2. Isn't this the formula? Thin lens low. Okay. Thin lens. The law of the thin lenses. Okay, so you don't you don't want to remember your youth? You hate it? Okay, here it is. So F is the focal length, O is the object distance, I is the image distance. And if you add the inverse of them, they have to match up together. That's the that's the thin lens law. Okay, so we have a mathematical expression for this, geometric expression for this, and we are going to use it in a few minutes. But it looks like I'm out of time. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Nobody's asking me a question. Next week I will start picking you, okay? I will pick one name from the list and I will make you ask me questions. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I didn't remember the F, F parameter. What, what, it, what is it? F, uh, F is the focal length of the lens, okay? The focal length of the lens is this um it is maybe maybe since this is a thin lens how do i make thin lens it is like this part oh that's bad thin lens and the other part is like that right so focal length is if i make this okay no i'm going to do this thin lenses are done that way there is a circle and there is another circle. Okay, this is my thin lens. Right? The diameter of the okay. diameter of the circle is my focal length. Okay? Uh, all right. I see. I see. Yes. Uh, Thanks. What is the what is the focal length of this lens? A rectangular infinity. lens. Infinity, yeah. Infinity. That's why we don't use these kind of lenses on our cameras because when you do one, one over F is it is zero, right? This one doesn't work. So if F is too too big, it's not going to work. If F is too too small, my lens will be very, very, very tiny. So I expect my F be between 10 millimeters to maybe 200 millimeters. That's that's what I am assuming. Okay. So I think it is 1500s that people have people have invented this uh, this formula, and it comes from Andalus. Okay. That's why it doesn't have a name. Nobody, nobody claims a name for it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, uh, sorry for my bad English. Uh, if you know the distance of object uh, with, uh, with a distance sensor, only a distance sensor, uh, 
You can estimate the size of object. You can estimate the depth of the object. Yes, that's called that's called depth from focus. Okay, it is possible to measure the depth of objects from their focus measure. Okay, and it's a field of computer vision. And if I have time, and if you are interested, are you a graduate student? Yes, I'm a graduate student. Okay, then then you may you may you may want to do your paper maybe on this uh, depth from focus. And I worked on. Just a minute, Efendim. Efendim. That's that's the information. Uh, so uh, uh, depth from focus is very interesting uh, subject area of computer vision and using depth from focus you can have these kind of depth images so the, the blue is closer red is far away and in fact, I worked on this a lot uh, with one of my graduate students, maybe give, give the institute. Maybe it will come when I do this. Yeah, these are these. My, yeah, these are uh, these are our images. Yeah. So Tarkan worked on this. As you see, there is a scene and with this scene some objects are blurred and some of some are not and you take many you take many images of the same scene and you try to figure out you try to figure out let's go to that page yeah it is coming from our pages uh, it is one of Tarkan's uh, papers. Depth from moving apertures. I don't remember. Oh, no, no, no. This is Sally's paper. We are moving the apertures. Yeah. He is changing the aperture size of the camera using this motor. Okay. Uh, there is a motor here. And these are seen, and he is calculating the depth. So these are definitely good, um, interesting ways of calculating the depth. And there are ways of doing it. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? I guess no. Okay, I will see you next week then. Do you think we should start at 1.30 or 2.30? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1.30 is good. 1.30 okay, is good. Okay, so we will we will keep it that way. So 1.30 next week, we will, we will, I'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.